Father, thank you for this morning. Once again, just uh, rejoicing in Jesus and for the fountain that flows so freely from the grace of God in your son, Jesus. And here we are as saints, people of God, gathered in these small windows, but we've been redeemed and washed by the precious blood of the Lamb, and we celebrate you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much for the liberty and the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, and we claim all of the benefits that are ours, every one of them, because of the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank you. And thank you for the boldness with which we can come into your presence without a sense of, of uh, timidity, but we come boldly um, at the throne of grace, uh, just seeking your face this morning. And we're grateful for the community of believers that have gathered this morning. And thank you again for the favor and the covering that you have upon us in our lives. We sense a, a great, a great, um, in, unimaginable love that you have for us. And thank you for the fullness of your presence that's being manifested by the Spirit of God this morning in this, this Zoom space this morning. And for every uh, soul that's gathered, we uh, invite you to make your presence known through the words, the meditations of our hearts, the songs that will be sang, the scripture that will be read, the gospel that will be proclaimed. Salvation is of the Lord. It's your work. It's what you do. It's who you are. You're such a gracious God. Kind God. Just staggering. The level of kindness in the face of such wretchedness. You're an amazing God. And we bless you this morning. Thank you again for your son Jesus. And for these precious, precious people of God. Thank you for the glory that's upon your people. Every house that's represented, every family, every child, every husband, every wife, every man, every woman. Thank you for your favor upon them. Now be pleased, we pray, with uh, the worship that takes place in this, this time that we've set aside. We've hollowed it out for you and for your glory. This we ask in Jesus' name. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's. <laughs> yes, it is. And the fullness thereof and the world and they who dwell in it. We're his, beloved. Every, every, every soul. In fact, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no place, no thing, no object. Nothing exists that does not have his copyright on it. It belongs to him. You belong to him. We belong to him in a special way because we're in Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm just rejoicing. I'm, I'm just uh, overwhelmed this morning with a sense of glory that God has bestowed upon us. I just rejoice with you. The sweet, the sweet promise of his return. Nothing compares with that. Um, well, let me ask it this way. Would you, would you prefer to stay here as the world exists now? Or would you prefer the promise of his return? And I know that's kind of rhetorical. You and I both, we want, we want. We want the glory of his, his presence being expressed in this world. And what a shame, what a shame that our world lacks the fullness of the glory of Jesus Christ. Well, one day, one day, yeah, the mountains will bow down, the seas will roar at the sound of his name. Thank the Lord for that and that great promise that's ours. And last, uh, last time together, we were looking at this idea in, in uh, Second Thessalonians about the promise that we have in Jesus that he will return. He will return to this earth. 
we're looking here in Second Thessalonians. I'm going to read, reiterate what we've read before here in Second Thessalonians, chapter two. Actually, I'm, I'm calling it chapter two, but if you don't mind, I want to start at chapter one and read into as it flows into chapter two because we call it chapters but this was one letter paul didn't divide the letter into chapters and verses but the editors that put the bible together for the reading put chapters and verses there so that they are to help us with the transitions that paul made in, in his letter so i want to start in paul's letter second thessalonians chapter one starting with what we call and identify in verse 11. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of the calling and fulfill all of the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That the Lord would count us worthy. Paul prays that um, we would be, we'd understand that we're worthy. And, and for one reason, because we're in Jesus Christ. And Paul says, we all always also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. And it is a calling to be in Christ. It is a calling that we've been called to expect the goodness and the blessedness of God through Jesus Christ. And what a worthiness we have. He counts us worthy, beloved. He counts us worthy because of, of the precious Son of God and the value of who Christ is, the value of who God the Son is, has been placed upon us sinful people who have erred and transgressed against the glory of God. But today, as saints, we're wrapped in the value of who Jesus is. And so he counts us worthy. What a blessed, what a blessed uh, place to be. Paul describes it, the, uh, that, that he might fulfill all of the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith and power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, in us. Wow, counts us worthy to the extent that he wants the glory of, of the name of Jesus Christ manifested in his, in his, in his beloved people. And, and with that, with that, he not only wants, wants us to know that, that he finds great pleasure in us, but he also wants us to find great pleasure in the anticipation of Jesus Christ. And as the song says, that he indeed is what our longing, is what our hearts long for. No other pleasure, no other hope fills our joy, but the expectation that Jesus will return. And you and him, Paul says, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. What an, what an awesome place we have in Jesus. Paul goes on in his letter, now brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if it was from us, as though the day of Christ had already come. Paul writes this letter in response to what we believe was a letter sent to the apostle. Or someone took word to the apostle Paul that the Thessalonians were experiencing not only persecution for their faith in the return, in the, in the return of Jesus, but also that they're confused now about the return of Jesus as to when that's actually going to occur because someone had misstated or taught them wrong concerning the day of the Lord as if they were already in the day of the Lord. So he writes to them 
to bring about a sense of clarity in their thinking so that they might better understand the progressive plan of God regarding the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. And so how does he start this section of his letter? He says, now, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together with him. You'll notice in chapter one, he talks about the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. With Look, in, in, in fact, in verse seven, where he talks about the return of Jesus, that he will trouble those who troubled the believers. He will give the believers rest who are being persecuted, and their rest will be at the revelation of Jesus from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Paul's thinking, what he's describing here in chapter one is the visible physical return of Jesus to the earth. However, he draws a distinction between the visible physical return of Jesus to the earth in chapter one and draws a distinction concerning what we're going to identify as our gathering together to meet the Lord in the air. There are two different events that are going on here. Both are kind of summed up in what we call the return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. The visible, physical return of Jesus to the earth is being talked about in chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians. Our gathering together with the Lord is what Paul refers to in the first letter of Thessalonians. He calls this the parousia in chapter 4 of Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Go with me there. Go with me there in First Thessalonians chapter 4. And you'll see these words in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Clearly here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is informing them about the parousia, the coming, the gathering together, the snatching away, where it says that we shall be caught up. The word caught up, the word there Paul used was parousia. We, in our, in our English understanding of what a parousia, it means to be snatched away, as if a, a thief were snatching a purse. Well, that's what's going to be happen. That's what's going to happen when Jesus snatches the church out of the world. And we, the believers, the saints, will be caught up, parousia, snatched away to meet the Lord in the air. That is one phase of the second coming of Jesus. But what you'll notice there is Jesus does not visibly and physically come back to the earth. Rather, the church meets the Lord in the air. That's what we see happening. That's the first phase of Jesus return to the earth. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a footnote here. Jesus has to get the church out of the way before he starts judging the world. He has to snatch the church, his saints out of the way before he brings judgment 
upon the earth. In fact, look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I want you to see there concerning the day of the Lord. Look at verse chapter 5, verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He did not appoint us to wrath. That is, he didn't appoint the church to be a part of his program of judgment upon the earth. What does he do? He snatches them out of the way. He raptures them out of the earth. That's the English word for this idea of parousia, to be caught up, to meet the Lord in the air. And yet, some of the believers, apparently, in the letter to the second Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians, the second letter, Paul writes the second letter about six months later because of confusion in their minds about the coming of the Lord. What's interesting is that that was 2,000 years ago and they were expecting Jesus Christ then. They were expecting Jesus Christ to return for them then. But in the meantime, saints were still dying and they were, being, they were confused. Here we are. And some of them were, were being taught that they were in the day of the Lord. What we're going, as we go through 2 Thessalonians, what we're going to discover is that, yes, there is a distinction between what we call the rapture, the first phase of the second coming of Jesus, and the second phase. The second phase of the coming of Jesus is the day of the Lord. That is the judgment program of Jesus that he will bring to the earth. The church is not going to be a part of that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, he has not appointed us to a to wrath, to the wrath that is to come upon this earth. But he has appointed us to salvation. That is deliverance from the wrath. Not only have we been delivered from the, the penalty of sin, we're being delivered from the power of sin in our lives. One day we're going to be delivered from the actual presence, the presence of sin and the wrath of God against sin. We're going to be delivered. And so Paul writes this second, this, this second letter several months later to help clarify the confusion that has come about concerning the day of the Lord. He starts here in, in uh, chapter 2. Once again, I can go back to it. Now, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, that the, as though the day of, the, of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. But that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Before we go any further, I, I want to go back to a statement that I made, a few statements that I made uh, um, week or so ago, and, and that is the, the question of why must Jesus return to the earth? I asked that question, and then I asked another question, why did he come the first time? And then there was a third question. The third question was, what will be his posture, his stance, his disposition, or his deportment, or his demeanor when he does return to the earth? Those are the questions I ask, and we're going to answer those questions through Scripture. First, I, again, I want to revisit. I want to revisit this idea of why, we, why Jesus must return to the earth. Now, it's interesting because Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, was attempting to clarify for the believers, to keep it crystal clear so that they would understand what God is doing regarding the church and the second coming of Jesus, meaning this that it is possible, very real, the, the, the possibility is that we can become confused about what God has stated in Scripture. Add to that, there are, there are groups of believers in different camps in terms of when Jesus comes, 
when the millennial comes, when the millennium is going to be started, will believers be in the millennium? Will he rapture us in the middle of the millennium or at the end of the millennium? There's a lot of, of con confusion concerning the coming of the Lord. It was then when Paul wrote the letter, and it is today. So for me to reiterate what I've stated before, I have biblical precedent for restating it because it, it demands clarity. And, and I want, and Paul wanted believers to understand it. He writes, now concerning brothers, the coming of our Lord. He wants, he wanted the Thessalonians to understand it. I want you, I want you and I to understand what God has revealed in scripture. Why must he return? And when I ask that question, I, I, I want to suggest to you that once again, he must return to the earth from a biblical perspective because of the principle of righteousness. I want to reiterate that. He has to return to the earth. In fact, in fact, in, in Psalm 98, in Psalm 98, verses 8 and 9, uh, the writer says, For he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness, he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity, with uprightness. See, it's the principle of righteousness. He has to judge unrighteousness. He has to deal with sinfulness and iniquity. He will, he will not hold them guiltless. No, no. He will judge the earth. He will judge the world. He must come back. The principle of righteousness demands that Jesus Christ return to the earth. In our day, in fact, all this, this week um, and last week, there was this human, human, just this loud cry for social justice. Our, our, our culture cries out for social justice in light of the unfortunate and, and just despicable way in which uh, George Floyd was killed. And in our culture, recognizes, in fact, the world, I, I believe, recognizes um, just, just how unjust the killing of George Floyd was. And we've said it, we'll say it again, we, you know, we'll see it in our minds again and again, they're showing it over and over, and our culture just cries out for social justice. And I want to want to state this, that we, we need to understand as the people of God that social justice needs to be defined by the scripture and not by our culture. Our culture has no right. Our culture has no, no standing to call for social justice without regard to what God says in his word. Our culture cries out for social justice while it murders close to 50 million babies. Think about it. It's a horrendous hypocrisy when our culture can so easily, legally state that it's fine for a doctor to kill a baby up to and including the, the third trimester. And perhaps that baby may exist, may, may survive the aborted effort. And still, they want to legalize the murder of that baby. And yet they cry for social justice. What, what I'm suggesting to you is that we can't allow the culture to define what social justice looks like. As believers, we need the word of God. So what are we doing? We're letting the word of God shape our worldview. Don't allow, don't allow the world to shape your view and your understanding of the world. Yes, racism is ugly. It's despicable. It's a scourge. It's a, it's a plague that has existed since the fall of man. It's not new. Racism is not new. And blacks are not the only ethnic group that have, that have suffered 
the humiliation and disgrace of racism. It should never be tolerated by any culture. It should, should be uh, summarily, summarily condemned by people and by people groups. It's unacceptable. My heart, my heart um, uh, just, just ached for, for the family of George Floyd. But I found something interesting in, in my, my heart as well, is, is my, my heart ached for for Officer uh, uh, Gavin uh, Chauvin, I, I think his name is Chauvin, that that he, in in his sinfulness, is is so broken that he could bring such such a hideous hideous end to a man's life, just snuff out a man's life without regard. That's depravity. And depravity shows up in, in, in all of its ugly forms in this world. And, and I say to you again, Jesus must come back. He has to come back and he will come back in righteousness. Racism, rioting, senseless destruction of property demonstrates the utter futility of man, of mankind to fix his problem. What do we re resort to? destroying property as if that will solve the problem. Rebellion against authority. Jesus has to come back. And, and so beloved in, in the culture, in their cry for social justice, one of the solutions is get rid of the police. That's, that's absurd, that's just absurd. The Bible says in Romans 13 that the police, government, government, governing authorities are servants of God. For the culture to resist and to attempt to get rid of police, that's their attempt to get rid of God's authority over culture. It's, it's, it's just senseless, but, but that's where we are. And I say to you again, Jesus has to return because of the principle of righteousness. He must return. The prophecy of scripture, the prophecy of scripture declares over 1800 times, 318 times in the New Testament that Jesus will return. He, he will return 318 times as sovereign. He will come back to reign. That's what the scripture um, proclaims prophetically, both in Old Testament and New Testament. He must return. And then he also must return, not just because of the prophecy says he will, but also because the prophecy declares that God will permanently set up his, his kingdom in the earth. You'll see that in Revelation 21. God, God must come back to the earth. And without him, there'll be no savior apart from Jesus Christ. But then I ask again, why did he come the first time? He's coming again the second time. In fact, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9 says this, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But he came once at the end of the ages. He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly await for him, he shall appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. First John 2, verse 2 says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sin of the whole world. Jesus Christ came the first time as a suffering servant to die as a, as a, as a sin bearer to bear the sins of the whole world. In fact, Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, 4, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Verse 5 says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our sin was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah says, all oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. And the Lord, God the Father, laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
that word iniquity in the in the Old Testament word alone means depravity and perversity was laid on Jesus. Think of the wonder of this. As perverse and as depraved as Officer Chauvin's actions were, the Father laid on Jesus, the pure Son of God, laid on Jesus Christ the sin of Officer Chauvin. God, save me. Save me from my from my self-righteousness that would look down on Officer Chauvin and forget about my own depravity, my own perversity. He laid on Jesus the perversity and depravity of us all. He came to die for Officer Chauvin. He came to die for George Floyd. He came to die for you. He came to die for me. Yet it pleased the Lord, Isaiah says to bruise him, he has put him to grief. He has made him his soul an offering for sin. That's why he came the first time. He came to die for our sins. He came as a suffering servant. But when he comes again, he's not coming again to suffer. He's coming again, as we're going to discover in 2 Thessalonians. He's coming again. He will cause suffering. 2 Thessalonians says he will. He will in flaming fire take vengeance on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel. He suffered the first time, but he's not going to suffer again. He's coming a second time to cause suffering on those who resist his authority. Oh, beloved, beloved, I wanna encourage you in these days, in these days of, of, um, of our anticipation of Jesus and his return. I, I beg you, I beg you, don't get caught up in the, in the cultural um, thinking. Don't, don't be led astray. Don't be uh, led down the path of, 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 of this culture that, that is essentially, essentially, they're, they're attempting in their own way to straighten out what, what is an offense. No doubt, no doubt these police, these police officers should, should pay the price for their sin against George Floyd. Absolutely. I'm not trying to minimize the, the sin that, that's occurred there. But what I am trying to suggest to you is that's why Jesus came. Because we're all broken. And what Officer Chauvin did, that same stuff that was in, that's in Officer Chauvin, that's why he came to rid us of that same sin nature, to break the bondage of sin that shackles hearts and minds, that deplorable state that ruins lives, ruins families, ruins communities, ruins cultures. Jesus has to come back. And I tell you, beloved, he's the solution. And so marching, marching on Washington is not the solution. That's not gonna fix anything. Getting rid of the police, that's just going to exacerbate the situation. What you and I need to do is make sure that you and I, as, as saints of God, are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ as the only remedy, the only remedy, the only, only place where humanity can find help and hope and healing for their sin. Father, we are grateful for our time in your presence. Thank you for this Zoom, the technology, and all the, um, the, the skill that it takes to bring this about. Thank you for Mike and Guy and for those behind the scenes who are making this happen. Thank you for the saints, Father, who have spent some time here, critical time in your presence. Yeah, and as we've opened the word, we've shared, we thank you for the music ministry. Thank you for Carolyn 
and we pray that your blessing and favor may continue to be upon your people. Thinking of Pastor Ron as he will um, experience uh, surgery, just pray that you'll guide the hands of his uh, surgeons and bless him through this event and show him your salvation as you often do uh, in, in the lives of your people. You're able to deliver us from any from any of our afflictions and thank you for that. Continue to preserve your people. Thinking of Sister Frances, it was great hearing your voice. Sister Rose's family, praying for those guys and especially Yuli, that your favor will continue to be upon them. Draw them to the lovely Son of God, the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you will save them, Father. And thank you again for our time. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect, complete, in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, saints. Have a wonderful week. And Lord willing, we'll see you soon. Not me. <laughs> Not me, she said. Not me. It was posted. <laughs> it was incorrect. Well, okay, happy well, I'm future, happy happy right. future birthday. All right. <laughs> that's, that's I've, had right. One. I've already had one this year. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Enough time to move them fast as it is, right? You're special to have two in one year. No, no, no. That's not special. That's getting old. Um, we said we're still having anniversaries instead of birthdays. That's right. That's right. Anniversaries are the 21st. Hey, guys. Good to see you, man. Hello, Pastor. Hey, guys. Good to see you. You all have a good afternoon. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.